Well, now let's talk a little bit more about Stegosaurus. Remember I said that Stegosaurus was my favorite dinosaur ever. And because we have so many specimens of these things, there's been a chance for, stu for students or, or st researchers of this group to do more than just worry about their sort of situation in the rocks, but to actually examine or think about their paleobiology. And so let's look at that a little bit. Um, we showed this before, the picture of the sort of bones we actually have, and then there's the reconstruction. Let's think about those plates. I mentioned this before. Um, whenever a paleobiologist sees a particular character in a bone, a shell, a tooth, a footprint, anything like that, you try to come up with different hypotheses about, well, what could that function be? You see, a biologist can look at a particular feature and see its function. I mentioned the elephant ears before. Elephants have huge ears, and those ears function to do whole bunches of different things, but primarily they're very good at uh, cooling the animal off. The, el the elephant will spray it with water, uh, flap it in the air. There's an evaporation effect, and temperatures are reduced can't really do that uh, with dead things or long dead things many, many millions of years ago. But we can come up with hypotheses that are viable given the constraints we have from biology. So the first hypothesis might be that these things are an ideal defense against predators. And they would be, in many sense, the plates, but they don't cover everything. They certainly would deter a bite from above. So if you have a large predator, a T-Rex, an Allosaurus type thing coming along, it's taller than these creatures, terror is going to come from above. Those things are going to bend down and bite down, and so that would baffle the jaws of a bite from below. But we know also from looking at these bones, they're very holy. Um, they were draped over with skin, and then it's not solid bones. They have a lot of vugs and spaces there. They were very blood-filled, so a bite or a tear or a crushing of these plates would not be good for defense because it's blood-filled. It's a chance or place to lose a lot of blood. The second hypothesis goes back to what I said with um, elephant ears, large uh, flat structures extending from the body. These things can typically be used for thermoregulation or regulating temperature which might work, and it certainly would work for those big, broad, flat plates like Stegosaurus had, but the earliest Stegosaurs didn't have that. They just had those thin spikes on the top. And so the thought is that the first hypothesis was the reason why these armor plates or armor got extended in the first place, to make spines that were some sort of defensive mechanism. And then secondarily, expanding these, natural selection, favoring those organisms with wider and flatter uh, armor plating that could also operate as cooling. And so if you look, again, here's some of these early ones, Kentrosaurus, uh, Kentrosaurus and then I'm not going to even try to pronounce that Chinese name, but you see these early ones had spines. So there probably was natural selection for spines which are a defensive mechanism. The latest stegosaurs had big wide flat plates and so you have to think about these spines evolving into these big broad flat plates which would serve both a defensive function and then perhaps a cooling function. Let's look at their lifestyle this over a little bit. Their lifestyle is such that, uh, and I love this ancient uh, painting here, this is a Charles Knight painting, slow, methodical, vegetarians, habitual quadrupeds, always on all fours, uh, foraged at vegetation at the low end. And so here you see it again, butt up in the air, face down, eating machine, um, processing its vegetation here, very much like as you'd say, the cows of the Jurassic uh, Cretaceous. Biogeography, 
Uh, here's sort of a global map of the Jurassic, and you, everywhere you see a little dot on here, this is where they've been found. The very first ones were found in China, in the Middle Jurassic. By the Late Jurassic, they are everywhere, and you can see the dots all over the map. They're from the northern part of the region, the southern part, points in between. They dwindle very much so throughout the Cretaceous, and in the Cretaceous, we only have a couple of these things. They're very, very rare, and then they decline, decline, decline. By the latest Cretaceous, they're gone. So we're going to learn later, at the later, latest, latest Cretaceous, the very end of the Cretaceous, an asteroid's going to come. There's going to be volcanoes that kills the dinosaurs, but stegosaurs are a group that were very much in decline before that. And part of that reason, we think, is that we had the evolution of angiosperms in the Cretaceous. So angiosperms are flowering plants. We'll talk more about those later, but dinosaurs did not have good digestive systems or um, coevolutionary relationships with angiosperms like other groups did. And so as angiosperms become the dominant plant group on planet Earth, it means less food for these creatures. All the plants you see here are gymnosperms or uh, other primitive plants and not angiosperms, not flowering plants. This would have been the ideal heyday, the Jurassic, for these uh, creatures. Imagine all of this vegetation, most of their um, food source declining, disappearing, replaced by something else. It's not going to immediately kill these organisms, but it's going to uh, sort of take them out in the competitive game of evolution there. Another aspect of these groups is that they are the poster children for being the slow and stupid dull-witted, backwards, whatever you want to call it, uh, group. So again, an old cartoon picture of dinosaur brain power, dinosaur cranial capacity. You know, picture this stegosaurus walking along, whistling a song, da -da 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 -da, lots of open space, but he's going to walk face first into this tree here. So let's think about brains. We don't have preserved brains anywhere. That's soft tissue, but we do have beautiful preserved skulls. And these skulls, we can actually take them. And what we used to do is we'd fill them with resin or fill them with uh, latex and let it harden in there. And then you'd saw the brain in half and pull it out. You get a cast of the inside of the brain. Nowadays, we can do all kinds of MRI scanning and X-ray scanning and CAT scanning. We don't have to destroy the skull, but we get the same picture, an image of the brain. And again, you're looking at it. So a huge olfactory bulb in the front end of the brain of these creatures. Olfactory means your nasal or your, your sense of smell. So they were organisms like... Uh, other organisms today that have enlarged olfactory bulbs where the sense of smell is very important for them. Uh, their cerebral hemisphere, the sort of brain power area, is very low and diminished. Uh, so they weren't creatures that were processing lots of information. Uh, basically, they need to smell their food or smell danger in the, in the form of predators. Uh, process that information, that's it. Cerebellum and medulla um, coordinating other sort of features, non sort of processing or, or cerebral features of the organism. This is very much a reptilian brain. What we say is there's not much curve or extension. There's not a huge um, extension of the cerebrum here um, like we have. So a reptilian brain. You can um, sort of talk about how big they would be. A very simple way is to take a skull, pour water in, pour it out, and then pour it into a graduated cylinder or a beaker that's graduated. And you can literally measure how much brain space there is. Uh, for Stegosaurus, 
50 to 60 milliliters. Um, not very much. And think about this. If you took a living lizard, just sort of like a little gecko or something, but scaled it up to stegosaur size, the brain size would be much, much larger. For a house cat, 30 milliliters. So a very, very small creature has a brain power that's or a brain size that's pretty much almost there with the Stegosaurus. And then just for fun here, if you took a walnut, emptied it out of the nut and filled it with fluid and poured it out, yeah, there would be, again, they, had, they certainly had brains bigger than walnuts, but think about it. That's on a creature that is almost one to two tons in size. So yes, as far as we are concerned, stegosaurs have some of the smallest brain volumes to body size ratios of all animals. A house cat has a smaller brain, but a much, much smaller body. And so the brain volume to body size ratio of a house cat is huge. They're clearly very intelligent organisms that process a lot of information. Stegosaurus, not so much. You might have also heard or read that uh, stegosaurs are one of the dinosaurs that had a second brain. Uh, probably not. Uh, if you look at the spine of the stegosaurs, there is this enlarged cavity way down there back below the hip. And it's a little bit bigger, uh, substantially so, I should say, bigger than their skull brain. Um, who knows what it's for? Uh, it's been called the second brain that controlled the rear of the body. It's like those large fire trucks uh, where you have a person that is driving and steering up front, but they'll have another person with a second steering wheel in the back controlling the back end. I don't know, question mark, question mark. Um, it's, was it hollow? Probably not. So it probably had some purpose. Perhaps it stored extra fat, extra sugars. Um, there are birds today, like ostriches, that have these things. It would just be much bigger for a dinosaur. Who knows? Other aspects. Oops, where's that there? Let's move that up. Could these plates move in any sense? So we always draw them as sticking straight up. Uh, and then if you do have some videos of these things, they're usually sort of immobile. But perhaps they could have moved them or twitched them. So mammals today, like it says here, have this sort of twitching effect. We've all seen birds kind of go to a, a bird fountain, uh, some water or a feeder, and sort of flex their feathers, twitch them, move them around. Some reptiles can do that. So perhaps, perhaps these stegosaurs could move the, and flip these plates around as well. In which case, they might have been very good for um, let's get rid of these. Don't know why those are there uh, for defensive uh, mechanisms. And so Bob Bakker, big, big name in dinosaurs, uh, dinosaur researcher, dinosaur artist, uh, artist of this image here. So here's a stegosaur, and it is facing a huge carnosaur here, a, a vertebra um, carnivore trying to eat it. And he used this very, very poetic language describing it as a five-ton, too large, ballet dancer with an armor-plated tutu of flipping, twitching bone triangles and a swinging spiked war club. Um, Bob Bakker is one of the persons that in the late 70s and early 80s basically forced or, or directed a renaissance of our ideas on dinosaurs. Prior to Bob Bakker coming along and saying, look, we're reconstructing them wrong, we're viewing them wrong, uh, we did view all dinosaurs as slow-moving, dull-witted, you know, barely processing any information whatsoever, creatures. And you look at old, old reconstructions that kind of show the body postures that way. If you look at old films, they move that way. And he said, look, we're getting it all wrong. So he looked at the bones, reassessed how they would have stood, their stance, their posture, reassessed how they would have moved their gait, 
and then looked at a whole bunch of things like like the twitching of the plates perhaps and really revolutionized the way we look at this and so here's um, a nice summation of this uh, that incorporates a little bit of stegosaur paleobiology.